4, and I will read verses 1 to 16. Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod east of Eden. Let's pray. Father, would you help us now as we hear your word, east of Eden, as we hear your word in the consequence of the tragic nature of what we read about in these chapters. And I pray that even as we hear of the brokenness of your creation, the brokenness of relationships, I pray that you would help us to hear knowing that your word gives us something more than merely that brokenness. And that your word to us is life and goodness. And so would you open our minds and our hearts, our eyes and our ears to receive what you are saying and to be changed by it. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. The popular fantasy comic book series, The Sandman, imagines the realm of dreams and follows the misadventures of the mythological ruler of that realm. And two of the most prominent citizens of the realm of dreams in that comic book series are the two brothers that we meet here in Genesis 4. And in that comic book series, those two brothers are constantly repeating, constantly reenacting the story we read here in Genesis 4, only with Cain inventing new ways to take out his anger on his brother once again. And the insight there is what we read in Genesis 4 isn't just an event in the past. It is a repeated nightmare. It is a recurring nightmare, a repeated pattern in human relationships, in our relationships, from the smallest, most personal level to the largest, most global scale, wars and rumors of war. The story of Cain and Abel endlessly, it seems, retells itself, even in our lives, which is terrifying, isn't it? What do we do about that? Are we stuck in this repeating loop? 
Is there only this nightmare, or is there another dream? Well, like Genesis 3, Genesis 4 doesn't only show us the gone wrongness of the world. It also begins to show us how the world can be made right. And so this morning, I want us to bravely face the nightmare and ask two questions. What's gone wrong? And how can it be made right? So first of all, what has gone wrong? And what we find in this chapter is a problem with faces. Our faces are really important for how we relate to one another, and we find here a problem with faces. Cain and Abel bring their offering, they bring their sacrifices to God, and verses four and five tell us that God had regard for Abel's sacrifice, but not for Cain's. The language there is more specific. It actually says that God turned his face towards Abel's sacrifice, but not Cain's. The idea is of when someone looks at you with delight, with approval, with favor, with welcome. We've all experienced that, but this, of course, raises the centuries-old question, why? Why does God look with favor on Abel's sacrifice, but not Cain's? That seems arbitrary and unfair. I want you to notice a few details. There's lots of theories about that, but notice a few details in this text. First of all, both types of sacrifices are included in the Old Testament sacrificial system. Both animal and products of plants were included in the sacrificial system. But animal sacrifices were more central, were more important to that sacrificial system. And recall also the end of chapter three, where God covered Adam and Eve's shame, not with the leaves of the tree, but with the skins of an animal. Notice also that Abel brings the firstborns and the fat portions, which are the highest expressions of honor, the highest expressions of value. But I think the best answer to the question why, in line with those details, is the answer we find in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4 says, by faith. Abel offered the acceptable sacrifice. The focus is less on the contents of the offering and more on what those contents reveal about the character of the offerer and their relationship with God. And so Abel in his offering is revealed as a humble worshiper who values God above all else. Cain is revealed as something else, which is exactly what has happened and what is deepened in the rest of the narrative. We see the character of Cain unveiled. What happens as the result of God's face? Well, Cain's face falls. We've all seen that happen. We have seen someone's face express what's going on inside. And God sees that and he comes to Cain and he says, I see your face and I see what your face communicates about what's going on inside. And I need you to see that what's going on inside has made you vulnerable. Your fallen face, Cain, has become an open door. And what's at the door? Verse 7. Sin is crouching at the door and desires to consume and to reign over you. The picture is of a cat hunting or of a snake coiled, ready to strike. And this picture is really important because of what it teaches us about sin. We tend to think of sin as something internal. And it is. Sin is an internal inclination, but that is not all it is. Sin is also an external force. It is a force that stands outside the door, crouched. 
The New Testament will go on to say that sin is a power to which we can be and to which, in fact, we are enslaved. But the importance and the the gift of this picture is not only of what it tells us about what sin is, but also what sin does. The image, those made in the image of God are supposed to rule over all creation, including the animals, accomplishing God's design. So do you see what it does, sin does? It upends that possibility and makes it instead possible that those made in the image of God will be ruled over by an animal-like nature destroying God's design. And so remember God's design in creation is all about relationships of difference, peaceful relationships of difference that produce fruitfulness. So think about Cain and Abel. That's what Cain and Abel are. Cain in his name is related to the ground rooted and he's a farmer and farmers stay in the same place. They are stable. Abel in his name is related to the air. His name means vapor or mist, that which is here and then gone. And so Abel is a shepherd. Shepherds do not stay in the same place. They move. This is movement and change. And so to have a healthy community, and in fact, to have a healthy life, you need both of those things. You need stability and change. You need farmers and shepherds. But what Cain has done in his anger, in his competitive rage, in his status-seeking anger, is that he has opened the door of his life and this world to the force that will destroy those relationships, the force that will break those relationships down. The force that instead of producing peaceful cooperation fills the world and our relationships with blood-soaked competition. And Cain left the door open and he turned with his fallen face towards his brother what about you what about us have we left the door open the streets and roads of germany if you pay attention, will all over the place have these brass squares that are raised up a little bit higher than the rest of the street. And these are called stumbling stones. And they were put there as a part of a project begun by an artist named Gunter Dimner. And he began to place these stumbling stones out of places where Jewish people last lived before they were arrested and taken to concentration camps. So that if you are walking the old cobblestone streets of Berlin, you can literally trip over the reminder, not only of what has happened, but of what is possible. Genesis 4 needs to be that for us. It needs to be a stumbling stone for us. We need to trip over the reminder, not only of what has happened, but what is possible. So are you aware of the open door of your fallen face? Are you aware of that which would make you vulnerable to the force that would destroy your relationships? Are you aware of what calls to your anger, what calls to your envy, what calls to that tendency to compare and to compete Are you aware of that which would turn your fallen face towards your 
brother? What about the inputs in your life? The articles and the books you read, the podcast you listen to, the YouTube videos you watch, even the Christian ones. What do they do to your face? Do they open you? Do they make you vulnerable? Do they fuel that anger, that comparison, that envy, that competition that would turn your fallen face towards your brother? you're aware of the open door of your fallen face. Now that's heavy. That is sobering. And it should be sobering. But that's not all. That is not all that we find here in Genesis 4. And so if that is what has gone wrong, then how can it be made right? I'm sorry about this, but it gets worse before it gets better. Uh, Because of sin, Adam's relationship to the ground was complicated. Because of sin, Cain's relationship to the ground becomes impossible. Because the blood of his brother had soaked the ground, Cain loses the meaning of his name, and he becomes the negative meaning of his brother's name. There's a whole book of the Bible about living under that condition. Uh, the word, the name Abel is the Hebrew word hevel, which is the theme of the book of Ecclesiastes. And so Cain loses his rootedness and becomes a wanderer. And the word for wanderer, the word for wonder is, is that word nod in verse 16. And so Cain settles in the land of unsettledness. He settles in the land of wandering, of constant restlessness. And the word nod is the letters of Eden rearranged. And so we are witnessing in Genesis 4 the deepening, the intensification of the tragic alienation we heard about in Genesis 3. But like in Genesis 3, in the announcement for, of judgment is already the arrival of God's mercy. Because God, as he did with Cain's parents, comes to Cain asking where. And if you'll remember from last week, that question is not a question of information. It is a question of invitation, the invitation to repentance. And even when Cain refuses to repent, refuses to admit what he had done, God, as he did with Adam and Eve, sends Cain to live under the consequences of his sin, covered with a covering, with a protection. He sends him with a sign that will protect him from the full consequences of what he deserved. That word sign is used of the rainbow in Genesis 9 after the flood of God's judgment. It is used of the practice of circumcision in Genesis 17 as a mark of belonging to God's favor. So this sign that God gives to Cain, it is a hint that the alienation that he experiences and that we all experience will not have the last word. That his wandering does not mean an endless homelessness for us all. But there's a problem with this sign. There's a tension in the sign of Cain because it promises sevenfold vengeance on those who would attack Cain. And if you keep reading in Genesis 4, like we'll do next week, you'll find that that vengeance 
multiplies, exponentially multiplies and fills the world with violence, fills the world with the repeated pattern, the recurring nightmare of Cain and Abel. And so we see we need something more than the partial protection of God's mercy shown to Cain in this sign. We need the blood of Abel. That's what the New Testament tells us in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 says that Abel offered his acceptable sacrifice in faith. And then that chapter goes on to list a whole bunch of people from the Old Testament who acted and lived in faith. And why does it list those people? It is not so that we would do exactly what they did. The end of the chapter says, I've listed all of these people for you so that you can know that they are incomplete without you. Why are they incomplete without you? Because you have received what they in faith were waiting for. And what were they waiting for? Hebrews chapter 12, surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, chapter 12, verse 24, whose blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The blood of Jesus is the response, it's the solution to the cry of the blood of Abel. Because the blood of Jesus has the power to break the cycle, to break the pattern. The blood of Jesus has the power to wake us up from the nightmare. How, how does Jesus do that? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, because through his death and his resurrection and his ascension, he has brought us to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. And what is Mount Zion? What is the heavenly Jerusalem? Well, it is God gathering the people who are by faith in Jesus and returning them from their wandering to the home of his face returning them to the place where he turns his face in favor on those who belong to him. So, 1 John chapter 3, another place in the New Testament, tells us that it is possible for the pattern of Cain to enter even the church. And it says in chapter 3, Church, don't live like Cain in relationship to one another. But how is that possible? Chapter four, those who love their brothers, they love their brothers because they love God. And how is it possible for you to love God which produces a love for your brother? Well, it's not because you first loved him. It's because he first loved you and gave his son as an atoning sacrifice, an atoning offering for you. You see, Jesus didn't just offer the acceptable sacrifice. He became the acceptable sacrifice for us. And so what do we do with our fallen faces? How are our fallen faces produced by resentment and anger? How are our fallen faces lifted up? Well, it is not by putting on a pretend smile. It's not by stuffing that anger way deep down and trying to hold it down there. It is not in in your own power trying to bar the door from the crouching beast of sin. It is to turn with your falling face away from your brother to the smiling face of God that has turned towards you in Jesus. It is to see God looking at you through his son. We respond to our fallen faces by hearing what Jesus teaches us. For example, in the Sermon on the Mount about our anger, 
about the difficult work of forgiveness and reconciliation, but we hear how he makes that teaching possible, reminding us in the Sermon on the Mount that we can live that way because there is a Father in heaven, and through him, that Father in heaven looks on us with care, so much care that he knows the number of the hairs on our head. We respond to our fallen faces. Our fallen faces are lifted up as we celebrate that Jesus, through his death and resurrection, has conquered the power of that sin that crouches at the door, has liberated us from the cycle, and gathers us into the communion of saints, into his community. And in that community, Jesus is respelling the nightmare of Nod with the dream of Eden. See, when you are enjoying the infinitely delighted smile of God over your life through Jesus, you're not worried about who has more, who has different. You're not endlessly looking around and ranking yourself in relationship to others because what more could you need than the delight of God spoken and enacted over your life? So what will you do with your fault face? Will you turn towards your brother? Or will you turn to the smiling face of your heavenly father? Will you let Jesus wake you up from the nightmare of your resentment? and live in the dream of God's grace. We pray it all in Jesus' name, amen.